Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for your patience and welcome to Development Control B um, today. My name is Cathy Guthrie, and I'm the chairman today. And thank you, everybody, for managing to get in. Now, first of all, remind you of some domestic arrangements. Toilets are situated outside the meeting room, opposite the stairs. Cold water is also available in the breakout area outside the meeting room. If the fire alarm should sound, please leave the meeting room by following the fire exit signs and meet on the Ipswich Town Football Club training pitch. Do not re-enter the building until you are told it is safe to do so. Please switch off all mobile phones or turn them to silent. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. The whole of the meeting will be filmed, except where there are confidential exempt items. If you make a representation to the meeting, you will be deemed by the Council to have consented to being filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. The Council, members of the public and press may record, film, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and press are not lawfully excluded. Finally, can members and officers ensure that you press the microphone for speaking and turn off when you have finished? So make the introductions now. We have Ian Dupre, our legal officer, Gem Gemma Walker, our senior uh, planner and manager, uh, Rob Carmichael, our governance support officer, Daniel, who is our planning officer today, and Claire at the end. We also have our committee members who will um, listen to the deb and debate and come to a decision today. Um, we have a ward member here who also happens to be the leader of the council, but she's our ward member, and uh, she will speak as well. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you obviously know who you are. There's the supporter um, being the applicant's agent and the objectors being um, a local resident. And you will have three minutes each, except where um, a dispensation is allowed for additional things. Is it not? Um, perhaps if I speak up, is that any better? better. Oh, don't tempt me. I normally do. <laughs> Trying to be quiet. Uh, sorry about that. Well, um, would it be better if we ask them to move forward? If it's uh, come into the glass? Yeah, I think there's a few. But I think if they, yeah. Do you want to come manager. forward a little bit into the next row? If it if it makes it a bit clearer and stops it echoing a bit, can we it's help? Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe some others might be quieter as well. I'm not normally known for being quiet. <laughs> Can you hear me, Councillor? Uh, you're all right, yeah. <laughs> exactly, so you might as well come It just stops it echoing because they get the noise of the. Um... So we'll move on to the agenda, which is apologies for absence and substitutions. Thank you, Chair. None received. To receive any declarations of pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest by members. Mm -hmm. Declarations of lobbying. Yes, I think we've all had um, lobbying. Declarations of personal site visits. Confirmation of the minutes of the meeting held on the 30th of October with one minor amendment that we've noted at the moment, which is on the first page, is that we didn't lob Councillor Norris, we lobbied Councillor Norris. I do beg your pardon. Um, so that has been corrected. And then I will just ask, as Councillor Matheson is going to help us in any of the rest of it, are there any further adjustments, please? Well, at 73.8, um, where members debated the application, etc., including the design, um, for, for future applicants, really, as much as anything else, um, I, I was quite keen that the, the, the particular phrase about the aspect of land and the orientation of the houses was part of what uh, I was saying at that point. It, was, it went rather beyond the design of the proposal. Uh, if members would tolerate a little elaboration of the point. Um, anybody else like to help me with that? No? All right, I won't do it then. What did you want to elaborate? Well, what did to, you want to, to, say? To, 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 in, to in put another phrase in 
talking about the aspect of the land, which way it sloped, and the orientation of the houses. Those were the points that I was making. How about making. design and orientation? Yeah, 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 good, thank you. Members happy with that? Design and orientation, thank you. It's just we don't want to write a life history on there. Yeah, we'll do that for you, yes. Anything else? In which case, may I sign the minutes throughout the meeting? Thank you very much. Do I get a show of hands? Yeah, mm, yeah. Thank you very much, I'll do that during the meeting. Uh, to receive notification of petitions in accordance with the Council's petition scheme. None received, Chair. And we have the one schedule um, application today, which starts on page 19. And Daniel Cameron is going to present the case for us, if you'd like to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Is everybody OK to hear? No? Yeah. OK, so we previously considered this item back in October. Um, so. I'll run through a quick update for members. We've got the original presentation, if there are any questions pertaining to that, so we can go through those issues as well. Um, but I'll start by running through. So there, there are late representations from both the objector and the agent, which are available in the table of papers. Um, and I'll run through some of the issues raised um, there as well. Um, if we go back over the reasons for the previous deferral, um, it was for details of turning and parking areas to be provided in in greater detail for members. Um, it was to go over access and parking arrangements for disabled persons. Um, it was to look at the detail and location of passing places to be implemented along the access. And it was to give consideration to any possible alternative access available to the site. So if we come here, this was submitted by the agent. Um, if I, no, it's this one. It's this one, thank you, sorry. Um, so it's all a bit put onto one plan, but he shows an, a passing place here and a passing place here. He then shows the, the boundary with the neighbour's land here, which is possibly a little bit out based on the plans, but trying to overlay everything is probably quite difficult. Now, in coming forward, there's been a dispute raised by the neighbour regarding this area of land here. So we've had an updated blue line supplied by the agent. This indicates the land which the applicant has ownership over. If we go back, an element of that lower passing place, which is better seen here, falls outside the land on their ownership. So therefore, they'd be unable to implement it here. In going back to the agent, they've indicated a solution whereby the passing place at this point is moved over the road onto land within their ownership. Now, originally when this came before members, previously we had condition for details of passing places to come back to us by discharge of condition. We've considered it necessary to just reimpose that at this point so that the detail supplied were in their ownership is sufficient, but we'll just make sure of that. Um, I think the previous um, slide as well, if we just go back, also gives a, a, a valid reason to why um, the applicant isn't able to provide an alternative access. I think previously highways had, had, had talked about an access coming along here, there's an existing farm track and making connection to the road here. They simply don't own this stretch of land necessary to, to implement that access, so we haven't got any alternative access arrangements for you today, members. In terms of the previous plan we saw, there was a section highlighted. I've blown that text up there for our, for our benefit because it's a little small to read. But effectively, this comes from um, Building Control Approved Document B, Section 5, um, and the adopt is the adopted um, Building Regs document for our fire and uh, rescue service. So it talks at point 6.7 about requirement for a 3.7 metre carriageway curb to curb for operating space at the scene of a fire. Um, to reach a fire, the access route could be reduced to 2.75 metres over short distances. In looking into the building regulations document, no definition for short distances is given, um, but that pinch point is acceptable provided the pump appliance can get to within 45 metres of the dwelling. Um, 
Mr Lee in his representation notes that this 2.75 metre pinch point requires agreement from the Fire and Rescue Service which would still be required were they to go in but obviously this requirement is not part of planning members it's governed by building control and therefore is outside of, of our remit at this particular point. Um, in terms of um, Mr Lee's representation I just wanted to bring um, two images that he supplied for us um, in perspective here. This is an image of Mr Lee's access. Um, Mr Lee's access is approximately 8 metres long and is 2.8 metres wide. The white lines on either side are painted 2.8 metres apart from each other. Um, Mr Lee in his representation proposes the erection of fencing 2.8 metres wide so as to restrict this element of the access and if we go to the next image we see it with the fence panels in place. Now Looking at the image provided, it's my opinion that Mr Lee will likely require planning permission given the height of the panels either side of the highway. Um, the GDPO talks about a highway as being um, something over which vehicles normally pass and given that we have um, agricultural right of access and, and, and other rights of access over this, it's likely that, that at that height he would require planning permission in and of itself for for that. Um, in, in terms of this, um, Mr Lee contends that this 2.8 metre fence line would restrict access by vehicles probably over about 2.5 metres to get along the access. We'll come to the access in more detail but effectively from this point there's another 280 metres for vehicles to, to cross up. Um, if we come on to some plans supplied by the agent. What they've done is, I think there was comment um, at the previous meeting about red line sites um, and the appearance that doors on, on external buildings appear to open into the countryside. Um, they've just left the red line site as it is but provided closer, um, um, a, a closer perspective of, of those lines so we can see that we aren't um, creating dwellings that just open out into the countryside and that's also provided some more um, information over the amount of parking and the turning areas provided for each. Um, so if we look to bonds one and two, we've then got bond three, we've then got bond five. Now the other issue that was noted from the, the deferral is um, access for, for disabled persons. Um, so building regulations part M, category one, is required for all new dwellings. It requires reasonable provision for the access from the point of alighting a car and it requires the entrance and sanitary provision to be located on the same floor. Um, there are further adaptable and accessible standards that are available but they must be secured by planning condition. Um, so we need to go through the relevant tests for imposing those. Um, if we look at the floor plans for the barns, um, barn one, the ground floor, we have an entrance by here, entrance by here, and entrance by here. The two at either end are both close to the bathroom, all on one floor. And again, there's level access through here and through here. If we look at barn two, we've got access points either side here. And we also have an access point here. We've got bathroom at this point, and the bathroom at this point with level access throughout. If we go to barn three, it's much smaller. We've got an access and then the ground floor toilet here. Um, barn five is the only one that doesn't meet these tests. So we have um, the access and then we've got the bathroom provided on the mezzanine above, so it would not be step free. Um, but with regards to the requirements of building regulations, the underlined phrase is reasonable provision. Um, given that we're dealing with conversion of existing dwellings, it may not be entirely reasonable or practical or possible to um, fully comply um, and therefore it's left to building regulation to decide if that is acceptable or not. Um, but in looking at the, 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 the scope of the application on all four barns, three quarters would comply with that requirement and I think looking, looking at barn five it's simply an issue of, of the, the floor space being inadequate to, to provide that for them. Um, if we go through Mr Lee's late representations, um, I think we've got a few issues that he highlights. So 
It's the lack of access for fire tenders, owing to the restriction, oh, sorry, I've gone the wrong way, owing to the restriction of the access, um, and it's the passing place outside the site boundary. So if we look at the passing place issue, the agent has said that they're happy to deliver that via condition, and we'd require a condition at any point to, um, to require that. And then we have the issue of the access and the restriction over Mr Lee's land. Um, with regards to um, the existing rights of access, those are obviously dealt with largely outside of planning, a, normally a civil matter for resolution. Um, but in terms of the width, we've got 2.8 metres, which would be slightly above the 2.75 required by um, approved building control document B. And if we look at the widths of fire tenders in relation to agricultural vehicles that at the moment take access over the land, they're a similar size. In fact, some agricultural vehicles will probably be slightly larger in order to gain access there. Um, there is one final point that I think Mr Lee raises that I think is worth um, taking a, a, a legal view on um, in terms of the ownership certificate cert, um, supplied with the application. Um, in terms of um, the, uh, the, the, the time of the application, the applicant was secretary for the company that owns this area of land. And the question is therefore whether or not the applicant as a private individual was required to serve notice on the company, which for all intents and purposes was the individual. Um. Thank, you, Madam. Thank you, Daniel. Madam Chairman, um, the, it's very important that the um, land ownership and certificate requirements of the law are um, excuse, I'm sorry, if I'm, if I'm losing my voice, I've got a cold, do, excuse me. Um, the um, law requires that, well, let's take this in stages. You don't need to own land in order to make a planning application. However, you must serve the correct certificate, you or your agent must serve the correct certificate. In this case, it was certificate A, which says I own the land. That you could have alternative certificate B. I don't own the land, but I've told everybody who does that I'm making this planning application. Or there's others, C and D, which are, I don't know who the heck owns the land. I've done my best to find out. Um, now, in this case, I, if, if I've got this correctly, and Daniel will correct me, the, the landowner is, a, is and was a company, right? Um, there's nothing wrong, therefore, there is nothing wrong with Mr. Leonard, is it? A human being um, being the applicant because as I've said you don't need to own the land in order to make the application however in an ideal world Mr Leonard should have served notice on the company though that would at that time have involved serving notice on himself as company secretary of the company it's quite right to say that a company um, and the person who effectively is the company in real life through ownership of the shares and management is the company. They're, they are separate legal persons. That's something everyone learns in their first week of a law degree. However, um, my understanding is that the company have communicated with the council. I think the letter said something along the lines of that Mr. Um, Leonard was effectively acting as their agent. And it's awfully nice of them to say that. In a way, it's, it's solving the wrong problem because there was nothing wrong with him making the application. But I think I, 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 I am interpreting that letter to say, in effect, that they, they regard themselves as having been um, duly notified and are not make, taking a point upon this. I mean, I would say, Madam Chair, you'll recall I've always been very strict on this issue in this committee. My, about a year ago, we had a matter in Ricking Hall where um, I think I made myself very unpopular with an applicant by advising you to postpone something because there were three landowners rather than one and he was protesting they were his business associates and knew all about it and I said well that matters maybe but we can't go ahead today. Um, the point is I mean sometimes when a, if, if somebody challenges a permission in the High Court the High Court has discretion and they can say well there's no real harm done we're not going to undo and do this permission. We, we, unlike the High Court, don't have discretion. However, my advice is that in all of these circumstances that the law has now been complied with in the light of what the company 
which is the landowner is and was the landowner has said but i'll be happy to answer any questions if any member has any more concerns about that um, i think there was one other issue in mr lee's representation that i think bears a little bit extra um, going over and that was reference to the hibbert test um, now there is a great example of a building that fails the hibbert test within this site um, and I will just get it for you members, so you've got the images before you. But that is barn number four. Um, that is the barn located here. Um, now, the Hibbit test itself um, applies to Class Q barn conversions. So these are conversions of agricultural buildings made under permitted development, but there's an application to us for prior approval. Um, and we sort of look at certain details like um, highways issues, flooding issues, um, things like that, but effectively um, national government presents planning permission and the prior approval is like a, a discharge of conditions in effect. Um, what the Hibbert test talks about is, with reference to Class Q, what a qualifying agricultural building is. And in terms of Class Q, it is, it, 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 the Hibbert test talks about the, the structural integrity of that building and what works are reasonably necessary for habitation and what works um, are not. And in, in effect, something like this structure here, this Dutch barn open on all sides but with a roof, would fail the Hibbert test because in order to turn this into a dwelling, you'd effectively have to build complete new walls here on the outside. If we look back through the application um, and we look at another barn, we've got barn number three here, you have walls and a roof. Okay, we have this large opening here, but it's probably considered reasonably necessary to enclose that for human habitation, and so would not fail the test. Um, similarly with uh, barn two, it's not a great image. I think the image of barn number one might be more useful for your members. Um, again, we have walls and a roof. On Internally within the structure, it might be relevant to um, insulate those external walls. It might be necessary to take some repair works to those external walls. But what the Hibbert test talks about is where you would be completely constructing a, a, an external wall or, or, or roof that is unacceptable. And the building therefore fails to be considered for class Q barn conversion under those, those circumstances. Now, with regards to Hibbert and the planning history on site, we previously had an application um, on site made in 2018, which considered the conversion of all five barns. So it included barn number four, um, and officers um, decided on that occasion that barn four did not meet with policy, it failed this, this Hibbert test, um, and that additions to barn number five went above and beyond the, the scope of the policy as well, and, and the application was refused. We then had a, a subsequent reapplication. Barn four was removed, um, but the works of barn five remained, and we felt it was still contrary to policy and issued a refusal on that basis. We've now got this application before us, which has been revised substantially from those initial applications, and we now have no policy issues with the, um, the, the, the proposed conversions of the, of the two modern buildings. They no longer fail that, that Hibbert test threshold. I, if I may, just on that, just, I think the point has been very well explained, but you have in front of you a planning application. It's perfectly all right to grant the planning application that means something would happen that wouldn't be allowed under the Hibbert test, because that's what planning permission's for. Pl the Hibbert test relates to permitted development rights and prior approval. It, its relevance would be if, if there was an argument about what we call the fallback position that, well, if you refuse this application, I could do it anyway under permitted development, to which the answer might be, no, you can't, because it fails the Hibbert test. But I think, I think hopefully that point is, is, is understood now and it is, is fine. Yeah, um, so if we was through the, um, the remainder of the, the presentation. So we've gone through the reasons for, for deferral members. Um, we've gone over the parking and turning areas. We've gone over the, the provision for, for access. So we have the site location plan. This is unchanged. We've got the constraints overlay here for you members. We've got two 
uh, grade two listed barns within the application site. That's barn number one and barn number two. There's also the grade two listed farmhouse just outside of the application site. And the sort of orange overlay uh, represents the fact that we've got a triple SI um, impact zone. Um, that's Mickfield Meadow. Consultation with Natural England with regards to the triple SI impact zone has revealed no objection to the application. Um, here we've got the aerial map, and I think this map is worth paying some attention to, and it shows the road access. So we have the road access within the site, within you know, this occupation. We've got the access here um, in front of Mr. Lee's property, and then we've got the remainder of the access here to the, the highway here. Sorry. But just a minute, Councillor. Sorry. Can we just finish the presentation, then we can come back to it, please? We're not into questions just yet. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, we've got the, the wider map here. We can see clearly that it's a rural setting. We've got that set out in the report for you with regards to its connectivity to neighbouring dwellings and, and, and settlements. Uh, we've got the site layout. And then um, I'll whisk through this because we've gone through it already, but we've got barn number one and the proposed um, elevations. Um, there's the other side for you members. 3D site plan. Um, barn number one contains some um, existing agricultural machinery, which is to be retained within this void here and in situ. Um, in terms of barn number two, smaller barn. Again, we've got a similar sort of um, design palette um, for barn number two, reflecting the sort of more traditional um, element of the, these two listed buildings. We've got barn number three, which is the modern barn. We've got materials reflecting that, so we've got a clear differentiation between um, the listed barns and, and, and this one. And then we've got this 3D perspective, so we've got barn number, number one, two, and then three in the distance, and this is four left open here. There's number four in more detail. This is five, um, and this is the proposed um, appearance here. Again, it shares similarities with, with bar number three in terms of the design palette. Um, here are the um, photos from the access. So this is the access from, from the road. We've got a, a neighboring property just off here. And this is facing west. And this is the access itself. This is that neighbouring property I mentioned. And this is the site access here. We've got a narrow farm track. This is the track leading up to the site. So here we have the aerial. So we've got the, the neighbouring property here. And we've got the access here off this bend. Then turns the corner and comes up. Here's Mr Lee's property here. And then this is the access within the applicant's ownership leading up here. I think that is me at the end. I'll, I'll, if, if we have questions relating to the, the, the previous um, presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll take those from, from committee because I, members will remember what they remember, they won't remember what they don't remember. And, and I'll try and provide a, an update or, or, or refresher at that point. Right, yes. <laughs> we'll have questions. Um, Councillor Matheson, you had a question and we'll go yeah, back to Yeah, that was slide, I, slide 19. Um, I, I just wanted to understand what was the public highway and what was the private road. Um, I saw that mentioned in the, in the report text, but I, I didn't quite get my head around how it worked in practice, and that was the slide that would give us the chance. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. So this is the access up to the farmhouse. This is in private ownership. We've got the access here in front of the neighbouring property. That's in private ownership. Um, there is a public highway at this point, and then there's an element of this track here, which is also a public highway. And then at some point, the track reverts to private ownership. Yes, Councillor Warboys. Yes, thank you. Um, can you 
There have been, one of the questions we raised at the last time we looked at this was about the um, access, I think it's barn two in particular, which was very tight within the red line. Could you just go through the actual changes that have happened to that to make it a better setting, if you like, for a listed building? Uh, thank you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the existing um, farm tracks within the site um, coming up around here. So, the access for this barn here, and then we've got access here off this farm track for barn two. Um, so, in terms, of, in terms of access, we'd be coming along be coming up into the site and then you'd have just a, a reverse off the off the track into into what effectively you're parking um, now in terms of uh, conditions we've asked for additional details of of actually how that's going to appear on site how that's going to be managed and maintained so we'd have all those details at that point members Has around, I, I believe that's uh, barn two on the right. And has a red line around the barn actually been moved further away from the barn? No, the red line is in the same place as it was in the original. All the, the what the agent has done is provide is provided plans um, at a large scale, so we can actually see that relationship better. The red line hasn't altered; it remains as it was previously. I think I think previously the red line was so far out that when we viewed it, it did appear very close. But actually, in in reality, when we get into that finer grain and that finer scale, we can see that we are um, not dealing with things that are then creating doors that open out into the countryside. Just keeping oh sorry, just keeping on that particular one. Are we saying that there's only one car parking space in the garage for that particular one? It would be uh, one space in the garage and then a tandem in front. Right, thank you. And then while I'm at it, um, can I just say, um, there's two things. You said there was machinery being kept in a barn. What's that? Yeah, so barn one um, was a threshing barn. So there's some old disused antique farm, farm machinery within that that was, would have been used. So you, you'd have this um, double height ceiling for raising and lowering things within within the barn, it's that it's that equipment that's going to be that's going to be retained and made a feature. So it's not it's non operational, but it speaks to the historic use of the barn and its sort of previous agricultural use. Okay, and then one final question. Sorry, while I'm on a roll, um, the the Dutch barn. Can you show the artist's impression of? Um, it, it shows the barns and the Dutch barn in it. Mm. Yes. Can you turn the lights down a bit, actually, whoever it is? Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't... Ah, so that there one, we go. right. Um, so, that Dutch barn is outside the red line, will it get incorporated for use or what's its intention? What's, it, it's in this nice picture. That's a question. Mm. Yeah, no, we, we, we don't have any, any right. detail. I mean, it right. could be, it could be retained, but. Sorry, I jumped ahead of uh, Councillor Norris. You had your hand up, I think, didn't you? I beg your pardon. Um, could you go back to slide eight, which was that plan you had, where you show the garage with a car parked in front of it? Right, thank you. Uh, to, to the right of the garage, what is that large area there? Is that a 
an enclosure or is it a hard standing? Or? So that, that would be enclosed private amenity for the, the use of the occupants of that barn. So that would in effect be their private garden. Right, and one more question. Uh, the preceding slide, slide seven, which showed the, show the proposed fencing, uh, you mentioned it possibly would require planning permission. Do you have any indication of the actual height of it? Um, yeah, I think I think from the from the representation, it, it seems to be two meters high. I think that for the purposes of the the general permitted development order, um, anything adjacent to highway um, for means of enclosure can only be a meter high. Um, if you're over a meter, you will require planning permission. Right. Yeah. Um, so if, if, if this was the intention of, of the neighbour, my advice would be to seek planning permission before erecting. Oh, that's significantly more than a metre, certainly. Mm. Yeah. yeah, sure. Okay. We don't know the purpose or whatever for the fencing. No. Okay, thank you. We can cover that one in debate when we go forward, Councillor. Councillor Humphreys, please. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, it's just a question going back to the access. Um, who actually owns, to get in my head, who actually owns that track? And also, what are the current access rights to use of that track by all properties? So, uh, let's jump back to this plan because it's a bit closer. Um, so, this section of the, the track is within the ownership of the applicant. Um, there is a section of track here which is in highways ownership. Um, there is a section of this track here that's owned by a, a third party. Um, there is a section of track here that is owned by Mr. Lee. So at the moment, this site is farmed actively um, and there is right of access, presumably for the residential use of the farmhouse um, at the end of the track. Also uh, residential right of access for Mr. Lee's property here and probably for agricultural vehicles to access the land as well. Thank you. Um, so lots of probabilities in there. So on the legal side of life, how does the access rights for that farm that currently is in place go forward to any development? Well, obviously, as, as we've said often in this room, the land ownership and um, planning permission are two separate things. On the other hand, the practicalities arising from land ownership may be a material consideration to whether you have to think about when you decide whether or not it's right to grant permission. Um, Councillor Morley, if it's a question, if not, can you save it till... Yes. Thank you, Chair. Can we go to the picture of Mr Lee's uh, driveway, the, the picture that Mr Lee supplied with his um, drive? And the next one. So, am I right in thinking that that is Mr Lee's private... It, that's, that is not public highway, is it? And it's not in the ownership of the applicant. That is Mr Lee's. So we, we can get confirmation of that um, from the applicant. So um, it's my understanding from Mr Lee that he owns this stretch of, of road. Um, I don't think this stretch of road is public highway. I think it's privately owned. But I think that the um, provisions of the, the GDPO don't make... Um, don't make a differentiation between what is public highway and what is private highway. It just talks about highway. Um, and I think that um, for the purposes of potentially needing planning permission, I think that would, that, that would, that would bite at that point. Um, because I think that the, the GDPO would recognise that um, where you had um, you know, a privately maintained road, you would still want for, for vehicular safety the same sort of visibility displays that you might on a on a publicly adopted road. Right. So, can I just ask the the fencing? Um, you say he would need planning permission for if it was higher than a metre. But am I right in thinking it doesn't really matter whether it's one metre or two metres? You still wouldn't get a fire engine round that corner, would you? because that is the minimum width. And a fire engine, if it was going straight, yes, I can see that that would work, but going round that bend, you wouldn't get a four metre length fire engine, if that was, even if it was only a metre high. So, um, 
the, 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 the one metre, two metre differentiation is purely whether or not Mr Lee might need planning permission for what he wants. Um, in terms of, of gaining access, um, we have the comments of the Fire and, and Rescue Service. Um, they've been provided with details of the, um, of the updated um, scheme and we have their comments um, before members in the bundle. Um, now, I take the point, I think it might be difficult to, to have visibility beyond if the height of that fence is two metres. I think it might be difficult to then um, also manoeuvre. It's, it's not a tight bend. Um, if we go back to the, the blue line, there is a bend, um, but then that is, um, you know, we could grant the planning permission at this point if the applicant wasn't able to implement the access. That would be something at their own risk. If we came to um, signing off for, for, for building control um, to say that it was a, an approved access and they couldn't demonstrate that, that again would be be at their own risk. There might be things that they can, are showing here, that they then cannot um, implement um, in reality, and, and that is part of the risk of, of, um, of undertaking development, um, that they might then not be able to implement the permission as granted and would need to seek to either readdress that or come back with a, with a fresh application. Any further questions for the officer? Not rather debate, but further question. Councillor Carter. Um, just regards um, the access as well, uh, could I just confirm um, the distance between where the car parks and where the access is uh, to the, um, and the main access points? Um, also, I did wonder, wonder uh, regards the machinery uh, that's going to be turned into a feature, uh, who is going to maintain maintenance of that machinery? Does that impact on the? Uh, does that make any impact on the floor, uh, 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 the passage to uh, to entrance points? Um, is that like? Is it possible for that to cause any hazards in the future that we might need to be having? Uh, so, in ter in terms of the the access. Um, Within um, approved document part M, there are requirements for um, level access from alighting a vehicle at its closest point to the entrance point, and that's all detailed within the building regs documents um, as approved. Um, with regards to the machinery, um, this is sort of this is non-functional. It is it is in there at the moment, but has not been used uh, for a long time and wouldn't restrict. Um, it's not located in a, in, a, in a place that would restrict um, someone from being able to access the property or from being able to, to deal with it. And, and I think with regards to ongoing maintenance, um, that would be a case of whoever then, subject to the works being completed, um, whoever then chose to purchase that property and live there, the ongoing maintenance would be, would be for them. It would be the same if you know we, we as individuals buy a house and we notice that there's a chimney that we later find out is, is, is tilting or, or, or something like that. It would be um, the private individual responsible for the maintenance. Thank you. Councillor Matheson. Thank you. Yeah, just going back to the previous answer from the officer there, um, uh, the, all about the, the implementation as opposed to the permission, um, are, are you saying that the... Uh, the the implementation would have to satisfy both building regs and the fire service. Yeah, so approved document B talks about um, a number of things that would need to be satisfied um, in terms of building regulations. So we'd need to be content that whoever was um, certifying the building was content with it. That be, could be our own building regulation service. That could be an approved inspector um, following deregulation. Um, with regards to um, provisions of document B, those are normally also run past the, the, the fire and rescue um, service as well, given that it does relate solely to issues of accessibility and fire and, and things like that. 
Right, thank you very much indeed. Um, we don't have anyone from the Parish Council, but we do have uh, Mr Barry Lee, the objector, and you may have uh, four minutes uh, for the medical reasons. Thank you. Before my minutes, uh, <clears throat> uh, no, I'm sorry, you don't start anything else. You start your four minutes and that's it. Thank you. The planning committee cannot make any decision based on information that's wrong. The information supplied by planning officer just now about the access route is completely incorrect. So we can't make a decision on this. That's it. Well, on what grounds are they incorrect? You need to explain it, please. And this, well, will, this, be your four, this will be your four minutes. Show me the plan of the whole access road. I'm going to lose all my information. Well, Mr Lee, we've read a copious amount, but I think... Sure, no. I'm sure our colleague will call the plan to help. Yes, of course, absolutely. The, the description of the access road is completely incorrect. If you give incorrect information and then you make a decision on it, then the, it, the, the decision is void. That's it. Do you want me to explain? Do you want me to explain the access road? Can I have some legal advice yeah, as to um, what we're going on here? Um, if, if Mr. Lee is saying that he disagrees with the information, then no. it, it's his opportunity to correct it and to say why he thinks it's wrong. That's not the case. I came to put forward my case, but the new information is, it blows me out of the water because it's completely incorrect. The, the committee can't make a decision based on information that is incorrect. It's incorrect. It's not just a little bit incorrect, it's completely incorrect. Um, if, it, if it were the case that, that the council, the decision maker, the plural here, the councillors were misled or misunderstood an important fact. That, that is potentially a ground for legal challenge. But we, I think what we're, I'm saying, what the chairman is saying, Mr Lee, is that you please tell us where you think we, that there's error. And I lose my three minutes. Well. Right, put the picture up and I'll show you Sure. Well, okay, then we'll start again, please, Madam Chairman, with that. Yeah. Weathering Set Road on the left, the first L-shaped track all the way to the field house is public highway. All the way, not some of it, or vaguely become. Can you just stop else. there? Can you just do that with the counter so that the members can see which particular bit we're talking there, about? All the way along there, to there, 2.7 metres wide in places, to the field house, past the field house, to a piece of track that is 8 metres long. You said it belonged to the field house, it doesn't. Then there's a track that goes to the farm that doesn't belong to the applicant, it belongs to Balamori uh, Capital Partners. That's 2.7 metres. The track is 2.8 metres. So you've not said anything about the fact that the 8 metre track belongs to someone else completely different. Well, can I help? May, may we stop again, please? Um, I, I repeat that it's important that, that decision makers have the correct facts. However, I'm just looking and stating the obvious. I mean, that, that what Mr. Lee's describing is outside the blue line, if I understood correctly. Um, I mean, it's important that the committee understand all relevant facts uh, that go to their, have relevance to their decision. Um, I'm not quite, sorry if I'm being dense, I'm not quite getting the point, Mr. Lee. Ownerships, and he's not saying that the, the highway goes all the way up to the eight metre section. He's not saying that the eight metre section belongs to someone else. He's saying it belongs to me. It doesn't. So it's wrong. The, the, the presentation is incorrect. Would you like to tell us which bit, if we put the picture up, where you've got the potential um, 
uh, fencing. Would you like to point out to us which bit you own? Yeah. That would be very yeah. helpful. Would that not? Right, there. Can we there's a, there's a, a little thing there that says end of public highway. That's fairly obvious to me. The bit in front of it isn't vaguely belonging to someone. That's the end of the public highway. That's why I've put my posts at the end of the public highway. The track beyond that belongs to another landowner and we've got rights over that track. The track is 2.8 metres wide. I can make the fences a metre high or whatever avoids planning applications, but you won't get a fire tender through there ever. Hang on a minute. We're, we're just trying to decide and get the clarity on the, um, the ownership of the land. So, for us all, where the blue line says end of public highway... Everything this side belongs to... Uh, the public highways. highway. Highways. So we're, we're content with that. And the little posts on the left, shall we say, one, two, three, four, up to the blue line, is that the public highway or on your bit of land? The that's three posts land, on the left. That's my land belonging yeah. to me. But okay. It, but, it has but not to the right. Rights. Not it to has the right. Highway rights over it. Yeah. So from the blue arrow round yeah. the corner to where the long red one drops in, yeah. you're saying that belongs to someone else, unknown at the moment. Yeah, I'm not allowed to. I don't know if I'm allowed to say who it belongs to, but well, it would be helpful. Well, so we let's know. call it. Let's call it Chase. It's Sorry? The, it belongs to Chase, who owns all the land around okay. the, around the so, whole Okay, so there's that bit of land where you're proposed fencing for how many metres there? It can be one metre, it can be half a metre, but it still prevents... All right, but it's somebody else's. And then beyond that is the blue line, which is what we're looking at, which is what we can make a planning application decision on. What happens outside becomes a civil matter, but I am correct, am I not? Yes. yes. But we need the clarity which you're kindly giving us, and that's helpful. So, members, are you happy with what we've tried to tease out at the moment? Councillor Gould. Thanks. I'm, 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 I'm a little confused in terms of... Um, I understand, well, the point about uh, considering all relevant matters, uh, that we need to have accurate information. Um, I'm struggling with the materiality well, yes. of, of um, uh, what, what Ms Lee is saying, uh, or a less polite way, I suppose, is, so what? What difference does that make in terms of the decision that we need to take as a committee? If I wasn't here, you would make a decision based on information that's incorrect, and that's not allowed. Well, I think um, the legal... Sorry, I, it's not quite, I don't think it's quite as simple as that because it is about materiality of that, of that information. I may say so. That's exactly right, Councillor. And can I um, just ask legal, and we'll ask it in the open forum, is that if Mr Lee is unhappy with any part of the process, he has the right for legal objection, a judicial review, dependent on whatever... Yeah. the decision is of the committee. We are looking at the blue line and we can make a decision one way or the other on what we have before us within that blue line. Um, quite right, Madam Chair. Thank you. So if we may continue then, if you'd like to continue, and you will have your... We're still holding sorry. and you've got the sorry, extra time. Sorry for my uh, strong... Yeah. Um, on the first plan, uh, the new plan that was supplied, we've talked about the 2.75 metre, metre access that the fire brigade require over a short distance. The next sentence says, provided the pump can get within 45 million metres of the dwelling entrance. The dwelling entrance is 280 metres away. So that, that's gone. That, that's the very next sentence. That 2.75 metres doesn't exist. I've got to skip through some other things in order to get to the important bits. If we were minded to increase the width of, uh, on our, onto our land, the fire brigade actually want 3.7 metres over the whole of that track. That's the, pro the public highway, our, our um, 8 metres belonging to Chase, and the 280 metres down to the farm. The fire brigade want that to be 3 Point seven metres. I'm asking, how would the planning department or the council ensure 
that the rest of the 738 metre access is also 3.7 metres wide, kerb to kerb, because that's what the fire brigade require. I've spoken to fire brigade on this, and it's, they, they will want the whole track to be 3.7 metres wide. How are the planning committee, the, the council, going to ensure that happens? Um, I don't agree with the uh, Hibbit uh, suggestion because planning application two was refused because the barn, forget barn five, barn three has never been, um, uh, hadn't changed at all, yet that failed the Hibbit threshold last time, it should fail the Hibbit threshold this time. Um, barn three, you said it's got walls, it hasn't got walls, it's just got cladding on it, it's got post foundations, it's got a dirt floor, the whole barn would disappear. It's not a conversion of agricultural building, it is a new build. Uh, as a new build, um, there's a statement 4.6 that, that lumps everything together, uh, all, all four barns. So uh, that 4.6 is incorrect. The, the application for the ancient barns has got to be separate to the application for the barns that are modern. They don't pass the Hibbit threshold, they're modern. They're new builds, in which case all the sustainability issues that section 4.6 tries to, to extinguish are, uh, are void. The sustainability issue, issues must come in, so the three modern barns must be a separate application. Uh, barn 5, for instance, has never had a structural survey. It's only bolted down on a couple of bolts on each leg. It's got a mezzanine floor. You can't put a mezzanine floor in a, in a category Q uh, hibbit. It just fails. It fails. Um, Well, I mean, really, the information that's come today is... We will ask some questions which might help you there. And, um, well, I, it depends what the committee want to do. I can't direct them what to do, but we will have some questions. Um, did you want to just um, just respond to a couple of things there, please? If I can pick up on perhaps some of the <coughs> Class Q queries. So we are looking at a planning application. This is not a Class Q application. Yes. The... Um, there are four barns in question, and I think what we're, we're saying is there a, is a potential that the agent could argue there is a fallback position mm -hmm. for Class Q for those. Now, the, uh, I think it was barn number four, the pole barn, was excluded from the application because we are content there is not a fallback position for that. It would not be conversion under Hibbit. It would be what is classed as fresh build. Now, because we're not looking at a Class Q application, it is merely that could be a fallback position and we've got to consider they do they haven't sought a class Q, but the reasonable likelihood mm. that they could and would is something we need to consider um, and i think what we're suggesting is that there is a reasonable likelihood that they would be able to convert those under class Q should they seek to do so as i said they have not actually got that class Q in place but we have to bear in mind that that could be a fallback position in due course for development of this site so that's where we sit with this. There is no issue with um, a planning application in this regard, needing to separate the different barns out. We have planning policies that support barn conversions, whether that is listed, not listed, or, or anything in between, if you will. So we are looking at this as conversion of four barns under our local plan policy. So hopefully that provides a bit more clarity on the Class Q situation. Um, and perhaps, Chair. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Now, Councillor Humphreys, this is questions for you now. Councillor well, Chair, thank you. Um, just two questions, really. The first one is, have you put in planning permission for fencing as of yet? I don't need to apply because I can reduce the fencing to a situation where it doesn't need planning permission, but it still restricts the access. That's great, and that's debatable because if <coughs> it's only one metre, I don't need to bring in my wing mirrors, but we'll get onto that in debate in a minute, so whether we can get through or not. And uh, just a point of correction, really. You said the fire brigade need 3.7 metres. Actually, it's clear and it's been, it's been evidenced today that they'd accept 2.7 metres over a short distance. And that's, that's, that's the fact, is it not? No. Uh, is that not a fact? So that is what they would accept if 
it comes back to them and they find that acceptable. I think um, the point that Mr Lee is making is that the, the 2.75, the next sentence within the um, adopted document B says that they will accept that travel through the pinch point provided they can then get to within 45 metres of a dwelling. That's That 45 metres of a dwelling is standard for all fire tenders, for all buildings, wherever it is. I think Mr Lee's point is that in constructing the fencing, it would frustrate the access of their fire tender to within 45 metres. So they would be unable to move beyond the point of the fencing and they would still be 280 metres from the dwellings themselves. Is that... Yeah. So, slightly confused. and I, I, I'm sorry it's not a question, but it's trying to answer this question so, so get clear in my mind. The fire service will accept 2.75 metres over a short distance due to a pinch point. Fact. Which will then, as long as it allows them to get within 45 metres of dwelling, well, surely once they're through the pinch point, 2.75 metres, they've got 272 metres to get to the dwelling. So, therefore, it does pass that test. Yeah, no, that's, that's my interpretation as well. I was just trying to... Would you mind? So I think where we're coming to on this also is, is I think we're all clear that the, the two metres would be looking to require planning permission given where we are at mm. with the highway. At a metre, as you mentioned, you haven't got to fold in your wing mirrors. It's got less constraints. So if Mr Lee were to choose to do that, it wouldn't have the same impact as a two metre high, which would require planning permission. So there is a slight separation between the two points. That's exactly the point, yeah. yeah. Um, just a point of clarification on something you mentioned. Um, for the section of the road that's public highway between the main road and your property, do you know how what the width of that section of the road is? I've had the whole section of the road measured accurately using um, GPS satellite systems, and I know exactly every point along the road. Its minimum is 2.5 metres. That's over a metre less than fire brigade require. Uh, the average is 2.7 metres throughout the 450 metre length. But the whole road is too narrow for the fire brigade's requirements. Um, I have a question with regard to that. What would happen if there was a fire at the current farmhouse then? Um, as I said, we might be minded to allow onto our land so that the 3.7 metres could be accommodated. No, no, my question is, what would happen to the dwelling that's already there if the fire brigade needed to get through? Would your restrictions stop that or, and, or what happens now? It can get through. It can get through now. Yeah, that's And the posts that I've put in are removable. They're easier to get out than unlocking the fence that's there, the gate that's there at the moment that's locked. We have to look at what's there now, not what might be there. So that's a point. Would that be that's correct? Quite, yes. Thank there's you. a gate there, right? And then there's another question I have. Um, farm machinery, my goodness me, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So you'd be restricting the access to farm machinery should the farm continue to farm. Is that correct, yes or no? The farm machinery doesn't go through that gate. It goes the other side of the um, pond at the moment. The gate through and the place where the passing place was in the wrong place, that is an access for chase, but it's only a, an insurance policy for the future. Right, thank you. Um, yes, Councillor Gould, sorry I jumped in. <laughs> so, it's actually a, a question for, um, for, for, the, for the lawyer, if, is that permitted? Yes. At this, which, it, which is really the, the imposition, it kind of follows on from your question, Councillor Guthrie, the imposition of, of metal post and fence, does that uh, offend the rights of those uh, who have current rights over access along that road? If you, is that question clear? Well, yeah, yes. It might be, depending on the precise circumstances of what those rights are and exactly what's done. I mean, it's mm. difficult to be very more specific, specific than that, I'm afraid. Mm. But yeah, the short answer is yes, it might. 
I think we've got to be careful. We're talking a lot about outside the red line, and we need to sort of, and, and, and I appreciate it, I'm doing it as well, um, but we need to, um, clarity for um, the applicant. Um, so, um, thank you. Has everybody had the questioning sufficiently? Thank you. If you'd like to return to your seat, please. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, well, uh, I think we've had sufficient time now. Thank you. So, we... Um, to um, Mr James Tanner, if you would, for the um, applicant. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, Madam Chairman and fellow councillors. First, I apologise for my slight tardiness this morning and delaying proceedings. Um, I'm James Tanner from Hollins Architects and Surveyors, and I'm the agent acting on behalf of the applicant. I'd like to thank the planning officer for a clear description of the proposal and confirm that since the last committee meeting, we have sought to address some of the design and layout issues raised by councillors. And I think the introduction of vehicle passing places um, and some clarity on the parking layer around the proposed dwellings we've been able to do this. Um, these revisions have been deemed acceptable by the planning officer and again I would just like to clarify that the passing places suggested are on land which is in undisputable control of the applicant. As well as the proposed conversions, the original farmhouse, Greenwood Farmhouse, is located adjacent to the northern, ed northern edge of the application site, which, along with the barns, has been served by the current access road for far longer than the principal objector's house has been in existence. The current access provides an approach for all the farm traffic that used to serve Greenwood Farm, and indeed, the previous owner has retained some of the surrounding farmland, which is also served by a right of way over this access for all types of modern agricultural vehicles. Therefore, both owners must be allowed access that sufficiently is wide enough for all farm vehicles, along with, for example, domestic refuse vehicles, which are in effect the equivalent to the size of fire engines. I think it's worth highlighting here that, and this point has been mentioned earlier, that if there were to be a fire for, say, at Greenwood Farmhouse, and access has been intentionally restricted by the neighbour via the installation of fences and posts, as shown in the latest objection, this could result in very serious consequences for the farmhouse occupants. Councillors have clearly had the opportunity to weigh up the planning policy considerations and the, um, of the application at a previous meeting, and I don't want to go through all those again. But I would like to confirm that in terms of the building programme and sustainability, measures will be put forward to ensure that the conversion of the barns is completed to as close to as passive house standards as possible, with things like charge points included with each dwelling. I think in conclusion, really, I think whether or not the current occupier of Fieldhouse tries to put up a fence to thwart the legal right of two landowners to use the access drive for agricultural and domestic vehicles is not, in our opinion, a material planning consideration. It may result in the need to seek legal clarification in the future, but it is not a reason to withhold, or not a valid reason, to withhold grant of planning permission, in our opinion, in this instance. And therefore, I respectfully request councillors to approve the application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do members have questions at all? No? Yeah. Uh, yes, Councillor Walboys? Yes, please do. Uh, you, you've just affirmed that the um, applicant has got control over the amount of land needed to provide the passing points after Field, field House. Uh, I'm sorry? Um, after Field House, yeah. uh, there's proposed to be passing points on the access track to Greenwood Farm. Yes. And you've just affirmed that the applicant has control over the land where he can put those access points. The passing points, yes. The passing indeed. points, yes. Yes, indeed, Councillor. Yes. Does he own that land? or Yes. He, he owns actual... Yes. ...the land? Yep. 
for the passing point, uh, as in the, you know, sort of the lay-by shape pull-in yeah. to allow traffic. That, that's past the field house and into the land that's in the ownership of the applicant. So the passing points put in on the privately owned track are those which are in land controlled by the applicant. So that's away from the controversial pinch point part with the, with the fences. Yes, yes I understand yeah. that. Yeah. Any further questions? No? Thank you very much. Could you turn the um, button off, please? Thank you very much. If you'd like to return to your seat. And we now have Councillor Susie Morley, who um, will speak on behalf of the community at large. Thank you, Chair. As I've mentioned before, I, I live in a converted barn. And so my natural inclination is always in favour of this type of development. Um, but my, my concerns on this are not so much with the development itself, but with the access. And I, I know that you're very clear that it's outside the blue line, but the field house doesn't even get a refuse collection to it because the, the track is not... <coughs> fit for our own Mid-Suffolk refuse lorries to go down. And instead, the, um, the bins have to be walked 450 metres right all the way down to Wuthering Set Road. Now, if our refuse lorries can't get to the field house, then they're not going to get to this new development either. The, at the moment, the residents of the field house can observe traffic coming and going and they can you know take steps to avoid uh, agricultural vehicles coming through but the i still cannot see how large vehicles like our refuse lorries like our fire engines even del delivery lorries the tesco's van how they will be able to get to this site and while I think the design of the two old barns are, are brilliant, they're really nice, nicely designed, there is also talk that um, on the new ones, it refers to demolishing the Nissan, Nissan hut and rebuilding it. So that is not a conversion, that is a rebuild. That is a total new build. A very little structure of those three barns will be retained. So um, I, do, I still do not see how, if this application is approved, it can ever be delivered because the access cannot be, cannot be guaranteed. I'll leave, I'll leave it there. Thank you. One moment, uh, Councillor. Yeah, I think that picks up on the, the kind of the class key versus planning application query that, yes, although they are essentially rebuilding the Nissan hut, that's something for members to consider whether you think that is acceptable. If we were considering under class Q, you get into substantial rebuild, you yeah. get into fresh build, that then does cause you problems with Hibbert. But because we're looking at a planning application, not a class Q, that would be for members to decide whether they think that would be unacceptable or um, in breach of any of our policies rather than a problem in itself. And Councillor, I have a question. Um, you um, advised about the refuse from um, Mr Lee's house. What happens to the refuse from the farmhouse? Do you know? I don't know. I assume that they have to do the same. Right. Um, okay. Thank you. Mr Lee may be yeah, able to answer that, sir. Councillor Matheson, sorry, mm -hmm. I almost forgot who you yeah. were. So, so the, the, uh, the, the, if accepting Mr Lee's um, uh, submission that the, the public highway reaches his property, so, so you're saying that the, uh, our refuse vehicles can't traverse the, the public highway to, to his property, are you? Yes, that's true, because um, they they would have to reverse up and they can't reverse that distance yeah. along that, round that right angle bend. So 
Because if they go up there, then they can't get back out again, other than reversing all the way. Sorry, blindly onto the main highway. Councillor Humphreys. Madam Chair, thank you. And um, it's a question really, sort of partly, you've almost answered it. Is it not correct that the reason they won't drive up to there is there are no turning points? But the truth is that if this plan goes ahead and the, and the uh, passing points and the larger area at the end of the field, there would be adequate turning points and it might benefit everybody with the refuse collection. Is it not also true that in rural areas such as this, it is common to take your bin down the track two or 300 metres and leave it by the side of the road because the problem is if people don't in rural communities, and part of the reason it's, act, it's requested is that it would delay refuse collections across the county. So therefore, if we went up every track, we'd never get is anything collected. this a question collected. then? Yeah, is it, so is it not true that it's not just because of the size of the track? There are other factors that actually determine whether that rubbish is collected from field house or field farm or from the actual roadside? Uh, yes, and in fact, my, my bins have to be walked to the end of a track. Um, so, yes, that's quite normal. Any further questions for Councillor? No? Thank you very much. Well, we're open for debate now. That's been quite a, a lively start to the proceedings. So who would like to kick off with that then, please? Right. Councillor Humphreys, always guaranteed to be I always give one. you a moment in time just so you can jump in. Um, I'll start <coughs> if I can. Um, I think it's, it's been covered, really. We're looking at the site of the planning, the planning application itself. It's the red line issues. Um, the access is definitely important. I'll come to that in a moment. In a moment. But really, it's about the, the actual site itself. And when you look through this, and you look at the changes and the compromises that's been made throughout this process, the actual plan for the construction site is really good. And it's an excellent use of old derelict buildings that if they're not used for something, will be derelict and will fall down and go out of, mis go out of use. So it seems to me the logical thing is to turn to housing. The quality of the design, from what I can see on the paper, is top notch. I always look at things as, would I like to live there? Well, yes, I would, definitely. Um, it's, it's a great place to live, and I think the buildings are fine. I think the accessibility and everything else has all been thought of as well. Enough turning points, the whole thing. I've got nothing wrong with the plan whatsoever, and I can't find any planning reason to turn this down on that plan. When we come to the access, um, we've discussed the access. Part of it is highways. Part of it is under the ownership of the applicant. And, uh, and there's an 800 meter, sorry, there's an eight, eight meter strip where we've got a little bit of contention. Um, my concern with this is, and I'm sorry, Mr. Lee, I do, I honestly do feel for you, but to put up a fence to me is wrong, and it's wrong for a number of reasons. It's wrong because um, the current applicant, uh, the current uh, resident in the farm, is then put at risk. Well, that's unacceptable, I think, in my world, totally unacceptable, because you're saying that if you put the fence up, fire engines won't be able to get through. So therefore, if you put that fence up, you're actually denying him a right of rescue. And, and there's no debate on this, this is my point. Um, and I think that's unacceptable. I also think it's unacceptable that that would actually compromise the new residents of this, um, of this, um, this uh, app application. And it's wrong. However, I do get your point about the planning permission. You're going for a one metre fence now. And do you know what? If I was in a fire engine, and I know this for a fact, and they need to get to the point of rescue, they will ignore your one metre fence and drive through it. So it's pointless. Um, honestly, it's just making it difficult for everybody and wasting your money and your time. There is enough room for a fire engine to get through. It's not articulated to get through that gap. It's a short pinch point. It's accepted by the fire service that they can accept 2.75 metres, of which they've got. In fact, they've got 0 0.05 extra. Um, so I don't see the issue with this at all. And, of course, planning permission, even if we grant it today, if, that, if that's the case and that's where it goes, it will be subject to that access right. So if they can't get access eventually, it isn't going to happen. So it's irrelevant, really, because that's not our, it's not our decision. It's nothing to do with us. We're concerned with the construction site. My one thing on the access, though, in, in, sort of in your side, is that, of course, then you've got larger trucks. How do they access the construction site? But again, that is outside of this planning committee. Because you can't get access, you're not going to get the planning permission, even if we, even if we pass it today. 
So I don't see that the access, this, we've all gone down this route, I don't see the access as a massive issue for us today when we're determining whether to um, permit or otherwise this actually planning application, which on paper seems quite sound. They're my points. I hope it's balanced. Over to you, John. Uh, no, actually, it's me. <laughs> um, just a point of order, well, not a point of order, a point of uh, information is that the person who owns the eight metre uh, stretch of land hasn't objected. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that one into the mix for members um, to consider. Uh, so um, was it, John, were you next up? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree, agree with a great deal of that. I think the, the in, in, you know, in common sense terms, um, the, the public would look at this and say, well, yeah, it's, it's not it's not quality development because it's, it's got these problems with it. But as we've winkled out over, over the hour, uh, it, the, the planning issues on which it might be refused are, are very narrow. But what I, ha what I was just searching for, and I have just, just found it now, um, is on page 51 is, is actually the detail of the highways um, submission, uh, which is actually re reproduced on page 22. I was just trying to see whether there was more detail, and there isn't really. And that is that there's an ambiguity that they're saying that, that there is a need for passing places and um, the, the, they haven't actually said whether they're talking about the public highway section of the access or they're talking about the, the, uh, the, 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 the applicant's ownership land um, as, as to where, where these might be needed. And, and I, you know, I think that, that that may well be, and again, that a condition will require that to be sorted out, but I, I just, I just do look at that that very particular point um, quite quite. Uh, Can I give you some carefully. help on that one, Councillor? I think we've got some. Advice. Yeah. Um, so obviously they can only do works within the applicant's own land, so that would be what highways would normally be looking to seek. If they were looking to do works on highways land to enable this, they would be seeking a Section 278 agreement, and there's no reference to that for the public highway aspect of this. Uh, and as we've seen, we've now got passing places proposed within land stated to be within the applicant's control. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's why I was looking for their detailed letter, but the... the you know, I think the ambiguity remains because they, they probably haven't recognised where the public and private I'm sure sections are. Yeah, I, I mean, they would have the um, red and blue red line from the application site and be aware that that's that, and, and they will know what, what is public highway. And as in, normally they would say to us, it needs passing places, we'll do this by a section 278 agreement because this yes. is highways land. In this case, they've asked us for an amendment. That's on the application site. Yeah. Yeah, you do. You do well, well, hang on. Yeah, we've, we've done that one. <laughs> um, anyone else? Uh, uh, Councillor Gould, thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, I'm Chair. Uh, as so often, I'm very grateful to Councillor Humphreys for his very clear exposition of the position, I think, and, and distinguishing the... Uh, the proposals for the conversions themselves and, the, and the, that development uh, from issues of, of access. I, I too find the development very attractive. Um, I, I find the idea, of the, the opportunity to preserve uh, those buildings in, in the way proposed uh, a, a, very positive, uh, a very positive thing. Issues uh, about access of what we spent most of our time uh, talking about, and there's a limit to which those, as has been said, have a bearing on the, the planning decision uh, before us. Uh, I do, um, like Councillor Humphreys, are, are somewhat unsettled by measures that may be put in which uh, increase the risk uh, to the residents at the farmhouse and, and to, uh, to this development. But I see nothing in, uh, and, and taking what is written, particularly in respect to the fire service, uh, and see what they have written in terms of their requirements as being, as opposed to being told by Mr Lee what they've told him, the requirements, 
well, he's quite right in terms of the need for us to satisfy ourselves about the information that we are using in terms of base our judgment, and I'd rather go on what I see in writing uh, from the service itself in that, in that regard. Um, so, I mean, if there are issues of access, then that may, will, will cause difficulty in terms of the realisation of, of this application. Uh, but other than that, I, I find it a very, very attractive um, application. Thank you. Councillor Walboys. Uh, well, I, I will repeat about the, um, the thought that's gone into the design and the um, preservation of the modern and the ancient curtilage surrounding the farmhouse. You've got two listed buildings which we preserve, but you're also preserving that kind of historical um, contemporary context. I, a big question for me is, is about the sustainability of the, the site. I, I had a quick count of the, the bedrooms. It's 23 people possible. I could be corrected, but I think it's 23 bedrooms anyway, bed spaces. Uh, four buildings, there's going to be possibly eight vehicles, which is a substantial amount of extra traffic going up and down what has been established as a very narrow track. So, so my question is really in my mind about the sustainability of the site in an isolated rural location without any, as far as I can tell, public transport. Thank you for that. Who else would like to speak? Um, sorry, did I hear? Did I see? No? Yeah, anybody else like to speak? No? Um, well, well, I'll sort of move this along a little bit. Um, like my colleague, I, uh, Councillor Humphreys, I have every sympathy um, with the problems that are surrounding Mr Lee. I too live on a single track lane, and I too have had development next to me over 10 years, in fact. And I too have four families, I think, now. Um, but we manage. They pass in my gateway, they pass in my driveway. As regards the uh, refuse collections, my neighbours used to have them on the top of the roof and they'd come up the lane with them dropping off regularly and they'd have to get the kids out to pick them up. And we'd put them at the end of the lane. But Mid Suffolk came up trumps and they have a small collection vehicle which actually can now get down and turn round at the bottom. And so I have that opportunity. I went from a very quiet rural uh, living, if you like, to somewhat more active. And with four children, three ladies who are going to have their boyfriends and so on and everything travelling, I know what your concerns might be. But we rub along together, we get on very well together. They've enjoyed their rural life and I've enjoyed my rural life, and I'm still living there happily. Um, I think regarding... Um, I'm not going to go on about the access, because that's something. We've had many applications where we give permission, and everything else outside gets caught up in either building regs or everything else, and that's not our decision here today. Um, there are routes that you could go down if members are minded to approve it, um, and that is your right. But I think looking at everything that we've got by way of design, if there were only two barns being developed that would otherwise fall into disrepute, we're in the same problem of problems of more traffic building and so on. The construction traffic, I'm not giving out my life history here, but I've had a place where we've actually had to have smaller construction traffic coming in, so you can insist on it, so it can be arranged. And it should be, for the peace and quiet of the neighbours and the, the neighbourhood. So I'm uh, in favour of, of this, but I am not happy that we have a very unhappy neighbour. And I would hope that um, things can be alleviated, shall we say. So I would be in favour of this application. So I want people to move on. We've had a long time. Does anybody, Councillor... Um, Richardson, please. Um, thank you, Chair. And I think um, I will touch briefly upon two points. One, I think, is just to reiterate um, many of the points that have already been made about the design, um, about the layout. I think there's 
I was going to say there's nothing objectionable and no grounds for refusal on that basis, but actually I would go further and say that um, I very much welcome um, the design, uh, very much welcome this style of development where it does improve, not only I think does it deliver high quality houses, but also preserves what are significant heritage assets. Um, and I've, I've, I've seen that in my, across my ward and it's been done very well and it's produced really high quality housing in, in good and appropriate places. I think there are still concerns um, about access. Um, I think we've talked about them to a great extent. Um, I think it's not an ideal situation, um, but I think, as has already been said, if the fire service need to get somewhere, they will. I mean, the reason I asked about the section of the public highway, I was interested to find that it was a, at a minimum 2.5 metres. Well, then, if they've got issues at the moment getting to the field house and the farmhouse, then I don't see why, under those circumstances, we could then say, well, listen, they, now that we've got an additional four homes, it's going to be impossible for them to do so. Um, so whilst I recognise those reservations around access, um, I do think they can be properly managed and mitigated through building regulations and conditions. Um, and so in the interest of moving this on, I would like to propose that we accept the officer's recommendation um, and approve this application. Thank you, Councillor. Who else would like to speak? Councillor Matheson? Yeah, as I've said, I, I, it, this, this isn't quality development, given, given the difficulties that it has. Um, but but you really, we, we wouldn't realistically refuse it on the basis that it was, didn't meet MPPF's general observation that it, it, you know, we should approve equality. Um, it is a very unsustainable location. Um, the, the, the conversion of the modern buildings um, really, without Class Q behind, behind this, as, as Gemma has effectively described it now, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be voting for, for approval, but as it is, th there are not reasons to refuse, so I, I will second the um, approval. Thank you, Councillor Matheson. Does anyone else wish to speak, or can we go to a vote on what we've heard now? Shall we go to the vote then? I have a proposer and a seconder. Are there any further... Um, have we checked the conditions? Oh, let's just check that out. Um, was there, uh, oh, I think um, there's something in here. Um, um, there's something about bats, but I wonder whether we can put some owl boxes up. I don't know whether it's specified in there. I know that. But I don't know whether the proposer and seconder need anything. Where is it? What page is it on? I think, um, so I think all the conditions are on page 36 of the report, members. Um, in terms of the ecological mitigation, um, there's some enhancement measures, and yeah, we can definitely make sure that includes owl boxes, bird boxes, bat boxes. Those are the sort of things you find in these sort of. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. In that leaves, case. Yeah. Sorry. Well, well. Yeah. Go on. The, the um, yeah the, the the one that I I picked up in the in the ecology report, um, they were saying that if if the um, I think demolition was described. I suppose there's, there is some. Um, if the works, let's say, um, were in the winter, then th they, it was recommended that there would be on-site ecologists um, because well, of the, the likelihood of, of the um, great crested newts and, and possibly one or two other species. Yeah, it is actually in the recommendations there, Councillor, ecology that, report to be implemented, yeah. Yeah, does that, would that be sufficiently included? I would think so. So everything that they include in their ecology report that they're going to do, we're conditioning to say you will do it as you set out. So on that basis then we have a proposer and a seconder. All those in favour, please vote. All those in favour of the recommendation? And those against? One. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, are there any um, site visits recommended? No chair, no site visits. So in that case then, we now close the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.